docket. That is case number 108310, State of Kansas v. Lewis. May it please the court, Kimberly Streit Vogelsberg, representing the appellant, Michael Lewis. I would request three minutes for my rebuttal time. Three minutes is granted. Um, I would like to start by addressing the jurisdiction issue that the court has raised and then move on to the issue of the jury trial waiver and submit any remaining issues um, on the brief. Addressing jurisdiction, we believe that this court does have jurisdiction to decide the trial issues as well as the sentencing issues in Mr. Lewis's case. First of all, the notice of appeal itself states that it wants to appeal um, the, the sentencing date. And at that date, in that hearing, the court did decide the motion for a new trial, which addressed substantive trial issues and we believe is sufficiently tied enough to the trial itself to preserve jurisdiction to hear all issues. In the event that this court finds that that is not sufficient, um, the court should still hear all these issues and find jurisdiction exists um, because we need to protect Mr. Lewis's right to effective assistance of counsel and his right to an appeal. The sentencing transcript clearly indicates um, that Mr. Lewis intended to appeal his convictions as well as the sentence. His attorney stated, we obviously take issue with the court's ruling. Mr. Lewis is going to be exercising his right to appeal. I'm going to ask the court to appoint the appellate defender's office to represent him in that regard. Counsel, um, the notice of appeal was filed by trial counsel? I believe so, Your Honor. Okay. And it also states that he's appealing from the judgment. Does it not? Yes. Okay. Yes, and that's a, a great point that judgment, um, a sentence is, is different um, than the judgment. The judgment, we believe, refers to the trial verdict itself and should be um, broad enough to encompass all trial issues. Um, continuing along with the assistance of counsel issue, um, because his trial counsel filed that notice of appeal in um, in what the language that he used referring to the sentencing date um, might be interpreted to contradict with Mr. Lewis's intent to appeal the verdict and the trial verdict itself. So even if this court finds that the language of the notice of appeal should limit that scope of appeal, um, I believe this court should decide all issues submitted in Mr. Lewis's brief today because Mr. Lewis has an, a right to an appeal and a right to counsel. Um, the language that the attorney used in drafting that notice of appeal, of appeal, which could be interpreted to limit itself to the sentence only, does not reflect Mr. Lewis's intentions. There's a disconnect, somewhat of a contradiction there between what Mr. Lewis um, thought he was appealing and had asked to appeal and intended to appeal versus what that specific date possibly refers to. What again was... Um determinations made by the trial court on um, the third day of April 2012 what what it was sentencing and you said there was also the new trial motion was taken up at that time also I believe so your honor right. um, and within that motion I believe they discussed sufficiency issues and factual issues um, regarding to that the um, issue of guilt itself. and that occurred prior to sentencing but on that day I, I believe so your honor okay thank you do you have any authority to give us that makes the link between what you want to happen and what we have in front of us? Uh, statutory authority or? Statutory authority, case law authority, anything that would tell us that when you have a notice of appeal that appears to limit its scope to the judgment, that that throws a net over all of the trial issues as well as the sentencing. Because really sentencing is the only judgment that a trial court enters in this case. 
Right, and I do not have any um, specific case law that grants this court that authority. Um, but as I argued before, Mr. Lewis's right to a counsel, his right to an appeal, and the fact that even, even if this court finds that there is no authority, um, at the very least, um, this court does have the authority to um, remand this issue for an, for an Ortiz hearing. Um, because in the interest of fundamental fairness, um, there was an attorney who failed to perfect and complete an appeal. I think this, this court should have the district court make those findings and allow the appeal to continue that way. Has How, there, do we have jurisdiction to do that? If the notice failed to give us jurisdiction, can we even order an Ortiz hearing? Um, I, I believe so. I think in many other cases that there's been, um, this court has um, found reason to order an Ortiz hearing. But um, that's when there's been a, a notice of appeal attempted and there was no attempt to amend the notice of appeal in this case, was there? Well, we can make that attempt if granted the opportunity. I think the notice of appeal filed itself shows Mr. Lewis's intent and the sentencing hearing hearing transcript shows him it's his intent to make this broader appeal. Um, and it's in the, the interest but of- I don't, I don't think anyone's questioning whether he has a right to appeal or a right to effective assistance of counsel. It's whether it's done in this direct appeal or if it's done in a, a post-conviction uh, uh, proceeding under 50, 1507. Right, um, and one of the reasons that I believe it should be heard now as a part of this appeal is because of the interest of judicial economy. I mean, the, the state has briefed these, these issues, we have briefed these issues, everyone's prepared to argue these issues, um, the record is, is complete, we have everything that we need. The state has not been prejudiced um, at all, they've certainly had time to prepare the notice of appeal doesn't have to specifically list the issues. That's what um, the appellant's brief does to put them on notice of specific issues. So they have received that. Um, there's no, no reason to go back and hold further hearings just to get to the same point that we stand here today. Um, so in conclusion, we ask that in the interest of fundamental fairness, judicial economy, um, and the right to his appeal, and based on the language of the notice of, of appeal itself, that um, this court decide all submitted issues in Mr. Lewis's brief. If there's no further questions on that issue, I'll move on to the issue of Mr. Lewis's jury trial waiver. Counsel, before you do that, for the benefit of our audience, would you spend maybe 60 seconds just relating the facts of this case? I, I know that we did put it in a brochure that we handed out, but I just thought some people who did not receive it might be interested to find out what kind of case this is. Sure. This case involves a conviction for felony murder and aggravated robbery. Uh, my client, Michael Lewis, was convicted of these crimes for the events that occurred in, on Easter, early Easter morning of, um, in April of 2010. Mr. Lewis had made a car payment to Mr. Tyler. He was renting to own a vehicle. Um, so the, the two men met up at Mr. Lewis's apartment so he could make that payment. They made that payment um, and Mr. Tyler left and went about his business and Mr. Lewis, my client, um, went to find one of his friends at a club, didn't see her, went on to get gas, went to uh, a Walmart, did some shopping, went to his mother's to pick up some clothes, and then later that morning received a phone call that um, from Mr. Tyler's family that Mr. Tyler had been found um, dead in his vehicle um, at his apartment complex. Um, Mr. Lewis fled sh shortly after that um, in order to escape threats of the family. He was a close friend of the family, um, and because he was the last seen, the family had become somewhat suspicious. So in order to protect his own safety, he decided to go to California to stay with family there. Um, police eventually found him, and charges were brought, and he was convicted, and this appeal um, followed. Very well, thank you. Um, the conviction that he received was by way of a, of a bench trial. Uh, Mr. Lewis attempted to waive his right to a jury trial, however, he did not do so knowingly or voluntarily. Um, the state has raised concerns that this issue, um, the issue of a jury trial waiver, is not preserved um, because Mr. Lewis did not raise that before the district court. 
However, I would argue that because there's no more fundamental rights in our United States than the right to a jury trial, um, there's an exception to the general rule of preservation. Um, typically, um, that exception is that um, to prevent the denial of a fundamental right. So in order to protect Mr. Lewis's right to a jury trial, um, this court should hear this issue at this time, especially because um, in prior cases such as the, the Beeman case, um, that court found that the district court has an affirmative duty to ensure that a defendant has a, a full understanding of the right to a jury trial. And where that understanding is at issue, it's important that this court um, hear that appeal and protect that right to a jury trial. So just as this court decided to embeamen, I think preservation um, it has been met in this issue. Let's, let's say you clear your preservation hurdle. Certainly. What is it that's insufficient about the not only counsel uh, addressing with your client his right to a jury trial? And it, it appears from the record that there was an extensive discussions regarding whether he should waive and or a plea, all, all of that, 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 that occurred prior to the court's inquiry. And then a rather lengthy inquiry by the court that uh, addresses the right to a jury trial and what rights he's giving up at that time. And, uh, and, and, and it's on the record, all those factors are on the record. What is it that's insufficient about what the court did uh, regarding the waiver. I, I'm not clear other than I understand that there's some question about his right to a jury of his peers and he didn't feel he would have a jury of his peers, but I'm not sure how the, the inquiry doesn't address that. I think you've touched on the heart of this issue is that um, Mr. Lewis felt that he was not going to receive a fair trial because he was a person of color and he believed that he would receive a predominantly white jury in Johnson County and that um, that jury would be biased against him. He raised that concern. Well, but that's a different issue. If, it, he, if he wants to waive the jury because he doesn't think that's going to give him as fair a trial as a bench trial, that's his choice. Well, I think it depends on the language. When you talk about a fair trial, do you mean uh, good chances at a trial, or do you mean fair in the sense that every individual has a right well, to a fair he, trial? He, had a, he would have an opportunity to make a, a Batson issue or a challenge the makeup of the veneer uh, on appeal, but he, th that isn't the issue here. The issue is that he waived it, and the judge told him, quote, once you waive a jury, you can't get it back later on, end quote. Exactly, but before you can waive that, you have to understand what that right is. And just as um, Your Honor explained to us now, there are bats and challenges, there are challenges for cause that protect that right to a fair trial. And this district court in this case did not properly explain that so that Mr. Lewis understood. The he court may not have been specific as to the bats and challenge or uh, but he did talk about the peremptory challenge process and that each side would be allowed to strike members from the veneer, that type. There was some explanation of that. Right. He did mention the 12 peremptory challenges, but he did not fully explain the four cause challenges. He said that each side would have a chance to look into these issues, but did not make it clear to Mr. Lewis that if someone appeared so that they could not be um, unbiased or unprejudiced that they would be removed for cause. He just said that they could look into this and then they could pick 12, which to Mr. Lewis means if there's, you know, 30 of the 36 and he can only remove 12, you know, that's, that's not helpful to him. He still is an understanding that he has a right to a fair trial. And had he understood um, the, the full, um, the full encompassing right of a fair trial, then perhaps he would have um, not waived his jury trial. In, in addition, the district court did not mention, um, it did not specifically tell him that a jury trial would be better and that he would have a benefit from 12 jurors with a unanimous verdict versus one judge making a decision. But so, the defendant himself acknowledged there were pros and cons with either alternative. Right, but those, those reasons were not stated on the record for us to fully determine what he understood those pros and cons to be. Do you have um, a case from our jurisdiction or any jurisdiction that finds a, a colloquy insufficient, a plea colloquy insufficient on the basis that cause challenges were not differentiated from peremptory or Batson was not explained? 
No, but I think that I can distinguish um, the the ultimate ruling in the um, in the Beeman case, where in that case the um, this court found that the jury trial waiver was sufficient, but the district court fervently encouraged that defendant to have a jury trial, and it the district court in that case corrected the defendant's stated reason for wanting a bench trial. So in this case where Mr. Lewis stated he wanted a bench trial because he didn't think a jury trial was fair and the district court failed to fully explain that, that fairness process and the, the, Mr. Lewis made a decision without fully understanding that, then I think that that waiver is insufficient. And I, I still don't understand what, what his complaint is about the fairness process. I mean, is, is, is it that it's just not fair if you happen to be of a, of, of a certain race or a certain religion, that there's not a jury pool that has adequate representations of that particular individual's race or religion? Is that the gripe? Um, no, I think the, his, his concern is that, it, that people were going to be on the jury who were going to judge him based on things that did not have anything to do with the case itself. So just as any individual, regardless of race or religion, um, that's what the jury process, that's what those four cause strikes are for, is to remove people who have prejudice or who can't keep an open mind for whatever reason. Counsel, I see you're out of time and you've reserved three minutes for rebuttal. Do you need 30 seconds to wrap up your argument now or do you want to wait and do that on rebuttal? Um, I would just say that for the reasons stated today and in the brief, we ask that this court reverse Mr. Lewis's um, convictions, and that concludes my remarks. Thank you, counsel. Morning. May it please the court, the state of Kansas, the appellee appears by Stephen Obermeyer. Uh, with regard to the first uh, jurisdictional issue, um, that to be court. clear, to be clear for the audience, the court raised that uh, on its own. The state did not complain about the notice of appeal, correct? Correct. And you're not alleging that you had that you were misled in any way as to what was being uh, appealed, are you? I I am not. Yeah, okay. And and that's just after years of having gone through this. Right. Right. <laughs> I pretty well, much know that. That the defendant, if they want to appeal something, they can appeal it. Right. But uh, if the state wants to appeal a suppression issue, uh, we have to show it substantially impairs, even though that's not in the statute. Uh, on the, uh, the the journal entry that was issued on that date includes, um, I think, in section one, it includes uh, information about the conviction, and then later on, it, uh, the primary crime and later on about the off-grid crime. So uh, that journal entry includes information about the convictions, does it not? It does. And in fact, the, the notice of appeal states that uh, the defendant is appealing the judgment and orders of the court entered on April 3rd of 2012. And that judgment form in, may not be a judgment ordering the conviction, but it at least includes information about all those convictions. Correct, and, and also on that same day, there was an order denying the motion for a new trial, uh, which was held, heard prior to the uh, sentencing hearing on April the 3rd of 2012. So I think the issues raised in the motion for a new trial, which was heard on April the 3rd, uh, is fairly included within the, uh, the issue on appeal. So in your view, the court has jurisdiction over the issues raised by the defendant? In, in my view, the court has jurisdiction to consider the uh, sufficiency of the evidence, the uh, issues raised in the, in the uh, uh, motion for new trial, and then once you have jurisdiction, we have this, what, can an issue be considered for the first time on appeal? Uh, whether, whether it's in the notice of appeal or not in the notice of appeal, and I, and, uh, I I, I guess that you, I mean, in, in the past, you have considered those issues. I can't think of a case where we're looking at the notice of appeal and seeing whether that's raised in the issue raised for the first time on appeal. But I think uh, KSA 223602 generally gives the defendant jurisdiction to appeal uh, 
an issue. And a preserved issue would be your a preserved issue. A preserved issue. Yeah. So that that would be my uh, uh, response on on that. Would you mind starting with the sufficiency of the evidence, sure. specifically with the aggravated robbery? Absolutely. The uh, uh, victim was found in his uh, Escalade uh, at his apartment complex on the morning of Easter Sunday. The, uh, his, his pockets had been uh, pulled out, which would indicate that something had been taken from his pocket. Uh, his cell phones were missing. He had had about $3,000, more than $3,000 uh, on the night before, before he went to Grandview uh, to see uh, Michael Lewis and collect some money for a uh, rent-to-own uh, issue on a, on a vehicle. And uh, the... Uh, Th those circumstances would lead one to reasonably infer, perhaps, that he had been robbed? And of course, he was shot, which would be the aggravated part. Right. But do we have to make another inference that he was not robbed after he was delivered to that parking spot? Because we you not only have to prove that there was an aggravated robbery, you have to prove that this defendant perpetrated that. And do we have to stack inferences uh, uh, to get there? I, I I don't think there's inference stacking, Justice Johnson. I think you have a, a person who's shot uh, in the back of the head in his vehicle, and then his uh, his money, which was in his pocket, and his uh, cell phones are missing. Uh, and so that would, it was taken from his person of uh, person or presence. Um, and uh, th and the, the main issue, I think, was whether or not Michael Lewis. Uh, committed it, and uh, that was the, uh, the issue for the fact finder, and, and we had evidence of uh, the defendant's fingerprints of just his left hand were in the back seat of the Escalade, uh, and the state argued in closing that because if you have a gun in your right hand, because he was right-handed, that that would explain the left hand fingerprints in the, in the back seat. Uh, you also because have- the, Because the, the prints were on the passenger side, correct? There, there was uh, fingerprints on the passenger side rear, rear as well as on the frame of the... But your argument is if you're seated behind the driver and you wanted to leave, you would use your left hand for that, whether you had a gun in your right hand or not. But the fact that his left hand was prints were found on the passenger side rear door, that would suggest that he did not use his right hand because he had something in it. Yes, that, that would suggest that. And at your convention, he had a handgun in his right hand. Correct, okay. because he was right-handed. And in addition, uh, the uh, defendant's DNA was on the, the driver's side door lock button uh, that morning, and it was to the, to the tune of one in ten and a half billion was that it, that, that it was the defendant's DNA. And the uh, victim, uh, Curly Tyler, had previously, w was very particular about this Cadillac Escalade and had cleaned the car on uh, the Good Friday, the Friday before this, in fact, somebody had seen him there cleaning it, and, and so I think that would also add to that. And then uh, you have the evidence of the, the defendant's cell phone uh, pinging off towers near the victim's residence, as well as uh, his girlfriend or female associate's cell phone in the same area at 2 a.m. Uh, that Easter Sunday morning when everything else you know, for the previous two weeks, I think out of 3,200 3, uh, cell phone entries, uh, the only time the defendant was in Shawnee, Kansas was at 2 a.m. Uh, on Easter Sunday morning. And uh, the uh, uh, defendant explained that he, well, he was at Walmart that morning uh, on his way to his mom's house uh, shopping for Easter issues. Uh, and interestingly, if you look at State's Exhibit 152, which is the uh, cell tower information uh, that shows how far these cell towers reach, uh, the, the tower near Curley's residence that, it, that his phone was pinging off of uh, isn't in the, in the catchment area of, of the Walmart where he claimed that he, 
that he was that morning. And, and then if he did go to his mom's house in Kansas City, Kansas, <coughs> that Easter Sunday morning, we know from th that his cell phone was back in Grandview by 8 o'clock that following uh, morning. Mr. Obermeyer, let me uh, get back to Justice Johnson's question, I think is, I guess my question is, is how contemporaneous does the taking of the property, cell phone and the $3,000, uh, have to be with the, with the shooting? In other words, uh, there's no evidence as to how those events took place, is there? I mean, in, in what sequence or how much time could have evolved between, it could have been a, a taking prior to a shooting, could have been a shooting an hour pass and then the taking. What's the evidence to, uh, in terms of that, or does it matter? I, th I think the uh, I, th I think in looking at the evidence that uh, his property was certainly taken from him, and uh, whether I mean I guess it's circumstantial. We don't know whether it was before or after the shooting. Uh, does well, and does that matter? Let's say it's. Uh, a, the timing of it. I would say if it's contemporaneous with the shooting, it probably doesn't, but how much time lapse does aggravated robbery allow? In other words, can you commit aggravated robbery on a corpse? Right, um, and I, I know there's a, uh, I think there's a case on that. Uh, I don't think it was briefed by, uh, by either side, because I, I think just because it, it would seem that it, it was contemporary, that his car wasn't there that long at the Cottonwood Park Apartments, that um, it, it was circumstantially it would be contemporaneous with the, with the shooting uh, that it was taken from him. Um, be, because I thought that the main issue was the, um, was the identity uh, issue sure. and not the, the uh, felony murder uh, robbery because something was certainly taken from Curly Tyler uh, when he was found shot. Uh, as to the first issue, and then I'll go to the second, I did want to add that the, 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 the blue brief and the yellow brief were written before the entire transcript was completed. Uh, I did not realize there were three witnesses whose testimony was not uh, in the, in the uh, transcript at the time, and those three witnesses included uh, flight evidence where the defendant was found in uh, Long Beach, California, hiding under a, a, mount, a, a bunch of clothes uh, in, the, in uh, his brother's dad's residence. And then, the, uh, so that was one witness. And then there was another witness who talked about uh, the phone calls that the defendant made from Long Beach, California jail, saying things like, I was gonna be in that house for a month. I was waiting to get identification. Uh, and then he, the brother's stepdad, or brother's dad, opened the door. He didn't have to open the door. The whole point of going out there, I drove 10 hours for nothing, spent all my money getting out there including the rental car, thinking I was been, going to be gone for years, months, uh, at least. And, uh, and so there was evidence about uh, if, he got, if they took him back to Kansas, not on a plane, if they let me use the bathroom without handcuffs, you're not going to see me in Kansas City for a long time. I'm going to Arizona or something, not going to be on a phone or a computer the next time he's out, because there was this tracking evidence that uh, helped uh, to locate him. Uh, and then in addition, a third witness was the uh, witness who testified about the cell phone towers, and he drove for eight to 10 hours in the areas pinging off of these two cell phones, and, and uh, State's Exhibit 153 is that map setting out his uh, testimony. So I, I think a uh, uh, rational fact finder could fairly conclude guilt beyond a reasonable doubt uh, looking at those, those factors as to issue one. Uh, Unless the court has any other questions, I'll just go on to issue number two. And uh, initially, uh, the state argued that th this is uh, presented for the first time on appeal, uh, which I know the court uh, can has the, prudent, has the prudential ability to consider for the first time on appeal. Uh, the, uh, the language from, from the case, uh, the, uh, Beeman, I think, or State versus Fry says, to serve the ends of justice or to prevent a denial of fundamental rights is one reason to consider a constitutional ground for the first time on appeal, uh, which I ag agree with, but if, if that's the case, you can you always consider it? Uh, 
or just when you think it's prudential. Um, and, and also in, in looking at the, the denial of fundamental rights, uh, the defendant also has a, if, if he's claiming that he's uh, being held in violation of the Constitution, he can move the court to vacate his sentence after the case is over, where we could have a full hearing as far as what his attorney told him or his family and friends told him, uh, as opposed to what happened here, which was his case was initially set for trial in October. Uh, his attorney got a continuance uh, due to a, uh, an illness uh, within his office. Uh, the case, uh, the, the next month, uh, there was a waiver hearing on November 14th of 2011. And the jury trial was, uh, or the bench trial rather, was February 6th of 2012. So we have several hearings between this time and there's no complaint about, hey, I didn't know what I was doing or waiving. Um, the uh, de defendant had prior experience with the criminal justice system, um, and the pre-sentence sets out his, his, uh, that experience. He was 24 years old at the time of the waiver. Uh, I think those are factors. And then in the pre-sentence report, uh, he doesn't say, I, I waived a trial because I didn't think I could get a fair jury. Uh, he said, the reason I waived and let the judge decide is because my lawyer said it was the best idea. Him and the judge are good friends, and the judge was supposed to look at the facts, which he didn't. Uh, that's not claimed as, as far as, one, that, that makes it sound like he did waive, but he just is gonna blame his attorney, which tells me there's gonna be a further uh, 1507 after this anyway. Um, but at the, at the uh, waiver hearing, the, the attorney, uh, whose bar number is 11756, so he's been around since the early to mid 80s, says, uh, I, we've discussed the jury trial issue on many, many occasions. I know. He had counseled with some friends of uh, his friends and family regarding this for a number of reasons, Judge, which we don't need to enunciate for record purposes. We believe it's in our best interest and we would ask to be allowed to waive jury at this time. And uh, Judge Reddick goes through a discussion uh, with Michael Lewis as far as do you know uh, you're charged with a very serious crime. You have the right to have your case heard by a jury of your peers. That complies with State versus Irving. Uh, if you waive that right, it will be heard by a judge. And then uh, there was a statement about, well, I don't know if I could uh, uh, get, a, get a fair trial uh, because of the jury issue. Uh, let me see. I forget what exactly what he says about that. But I would point out that the defendant and the victims are the same race. Uh, and the judge does address the the, the Batson issue. I don't think that the judge has to say the word Batson at the hearing because most lay people don't care what the name of the case is. Only lawyers and judges care what the name of the case is. But Judge Reddick did explain if, if, uh, if, the, if there are people who can't con fairly consider your case, they're going to be struck for cause. And then after that, you get 12 strikes and the state gets 12 strikes uh, and we whittle this panel of 36 down to 12 and discussed all that with the defendant. And after explaining it, uh, the defendant says, I understand it's, it is pros and cons to the judge, pros and cons of both sides. And the judge says, have you had a chance to consider all that and discuss all this with your attorney? Yes, sir. Is that what you want to do here? Yes, sir. And the court accepted the waiver. Uh, so if the court does consider it for the first time on appeal, I think that, that there's um, uh, substantial competent evidence to support uh, the waiver as far as issue two. Counsel, I see you're out of time. Would you like 30 seconds to wrap up? Uh, I, I, was, I would just leave the other two, two or three issues, on, rely on the brief on that. Uh, I would just ask, and we did concede that the sentencing journal entry incorrectly stated uh, per the length of parole as to the aggravated robbery count. So we're, we're conceding that. Uh, other than that, though, I would ask the uh, court to to affirm the defendant's convictions and ask if the court had any, had any other questions. Any more questions? I've got one. Uh, I want to circle you back to aggravated battery, maybe in anticipation of, of a discussion that we'll be having when we conference the case. Um, I, I think the point of the questioning was that aggravated battery requires the taking, um, aggravated robbery, I'm sorry, takes the uh, 
requires the taking be by threat of bodily harm. And that's been the language that hung us up. And I think the case you were trying to think about was State versus Harris, where we went through, uh, over Justice Johnson's dissent, we went through the facts of the case to indicate why you could draw an inference of a threat to the victim before he was shot and killed, and we know he was robbed at some point during the process, but since nobody was talking in terms of the people that were there, you had to look at the evidence. So my point is in State versus Harris, we had to look at the evidence of how the body was laying and the other forensic stuff to uh, infer that a threat would have been included in the crime that occurred. What do we have in this case that would give us indicators that a threat of bodily harm occurred as a process of the crime? Because if the guy just pulled a gun and shot him dead, those facts would be different than State versus Harris is my point. You see what I'm getting at? Yes, and, and I don't have the statue right in front of me, but, but I think it's taken by threat or by force uh, as well as far as aggravated robbery. Uh, and I, I think you have, have the force, but. The, the Is the instruction on ag robbery in the record? Must be, right? So we should look, well, be able to look there and see how it was instructed? The uh, waiver. Right, or the, in the uh, language oh, of the right. complaint. Oh, that's right, never mind. It, it'd be in the language yeah. of, the, uh, of the complaint. Never mind, yeah, um, we looked at the complaint. But, uh, but I, I, think it's, I think force is also an alternate means of, of uh, uh, yeah, I think what we have to do then is look at the jury instruction for your case, which I don't have in front well, of Well, and there's not one because it was a bench trial. But oh, sure. It's a complaint. Okay, I'm we, sorry. But uh, it, it would be an option within a means. So we have to look at the complaint. Of, of showing that it was by force. A as to evidence of threat, you do have the, the uh, well, the movement of the victim. He was shot in the driver's seat, and then there was some movement after that, uh, kind of across the, the seat, uh, the way he was uh, situated. Uh, I don't recall any coroner's uh, testimony as far as how long uh, the victim would have lived after he was shot before he died, uh, but he probably was still alive when there's this moving and, t and taking uh, by force. But it, as far as the threat, uh, I don't know if, uh, I haven't looked at Harris, so I, I don't know yeah. that I could answer that for you. Out of the what was the forensic evidence of that might have helped us know when that movement of the body occurred, or, or is there anything there that helps? Uh, I, I, I haven't looked at the coroner's testimony. Uh, I, 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 again, I was more focused on the identity issue as opposed to this Harris issue, Justice Luker. Sorry. But body was moved and someone else drove the car is what it appeared is that correct that he was moved across and his feet were behind the driver's seat and it appeared that someone else had driven the car well yeah. at least it, it, it he was in the driver's seat when he was shot and then was moved uh, the car the uh, car was not parked in its usual location uh, at the apartment complex was that an assigned spot? Do you know? Did the record tell us? It, it was just the stepson saying he usually parked at yeah. another, another that spot. That was my impression. It was it was a choice, a matter of choice, not right. a requirement. Well, I, I, I do have one more question, and okay. it's related to your point about preservation and the exception for a denial of fundamental right or, or uh, bottom line, we usually need to look at the merits to determ determine that. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of backwards. And I just wondered if you want to enlighten us on how to fix that, if there's a way to fix it. It just seems uh, like we always are going to have to look at the merits to determine whether there's a potential for a denial right. of a fundamental right. right. I, and, and, and you're right. And, and from the attorney's side, we have to brief both, you know, whether it was right. preserved and, and if the court decides that it was, you know, if the court considers it, Here's why, uh, but if if you say it's prudential, then that's kind of on a case by case basis. Right. Uh, you know, it would seem 
that it should be raised with a, by a motion to withdraw uh, waiver or something, kind of like a motion to withdraw plea at a hearing like that, where we're at least cluing in the judge that hey, maybe there's an issue here and having a hearing on, on that. But uh, other than that, I, I can't think of a re any other way to, to, to change go the about it. Yeah. language. Okay, thanks. All right. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. You reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Your Honors, I, I really don't have uh, much of a response to the discussion about the aggravated robbery other than to say um, the fact that he was shot from behind certainly seems to um, create a reasonable inference that he was shot first and perhaps without warning before um, perhaps even the intention of the robbery occurred. Um, beyond that, I'm happy to provide any supplemental briefing or a 609 or anything that this court um, requests. Do you happen to recall whether the complaint in this case used both the force and the threat of bodily harm? Um, it does say by force or by threat of bodily harm. Okay. And just so we're clear, I think when I asked you my question about your authority on this colloquy being insufficient, I referenced the plea colloquy, but of course this is a waiver colloquy. That doesn't change your answer. No, it does not. Okay, thanks. If there's no further questions, I would waive the rest of my rebuttal. I have a question about the uh, destroying exculpatory evidence. It, it appears to me we, we don't have any evidence as to who took that camera, do we? And we have no evidence that would indicate that uh, a, an attempt to break in would have triggered it to take pictures or that there was enough light that it could have taken pictures or that the battery didn't go dead to destroy the pictures. Um, so it seems to me it's, it's a real stretch to say there was uh, exculpatory evidence destroyed. Um, as far as uh, whether or not the, the photos were taken, there's certainly the possibility. I think a gunshot inside of a vehicle would be loud enough to um, trigger some sort of sound or um, vibration or um, reverberation or something that would trigger those um, that camera to take those photos. And as far as the location of the camera, I'm uh, I would um, guess if push that the person who committed these crimes took that camera afterwards, and there's a very reasonable chance that it was there at the time. Um, is, is there the any, even, even any evidence to suggest that there was a camera? I mean, there's no one said for sure that there's a camera. There's existence of a wire that may hook to a camera, but no one even recalls that there was. Even the person that might have installed it says he can't recall. I believe that there was some testimony that the wires looked like they had been pulled out of something, which um, creates inference that there was something there for them, the camera for them to hook up to. On the, um, wave, on the waiver issue, would you agree that we, at a minimum, would have to remand this for a hearing? We could not just rule on the record as to whether or not the, your client had been fully informed of his rights? I, I think that you could rule based on the record that he was not fully informed how on do, his rights. How do we do that without knowing what his client may have, I mean, what his attorney may have told him? I think based on uh, Mr. Lewis's statements um, at the hearing saying uh, he didn't, he didn't, he still didn't think, based on everything his attorney said, he still told the district court that he didn't think it was going to be a fair trial and he was going to get convicted of a crime that he didn't commit. So Isn't that different than having been fully informed of the rights that would get you to a fair trial? I mean, he may have fully understood his rights, he just may still have doubted the efficacy of the process. Um, I, I think that if he would have fully understood his rights, then he, um, I mean, I, I, I guess that's possible, but I think based on the language that he used, it's clear that he did not understand um, the extent of his rights. And I think that's different. Knowledge of those rights is different than just being told them. Any more questions? Any further presentation? No, thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Counsel. We thank you both for your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement.